All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Putting the BS in Behavioral Science, Avoiding Neurohype During COVID-19. I'm Allison Gakowski, and I am the Director of Global Research here at HCD, and the warmest welcome to all of our frequent attendees. It's great to see your names. For anyone new joining us today, we are excited to have you. Our goal in the next 45 minutes or so is to give you the tools to think critically about different applied neuroscience methods. And then we're gonna follow up with um, questions. And I encourage you to ask those questions throughout the session with a Q&A tool, probably located at the bottom of the Zoom platform. And for those of you who aren't familiar with HCD, we are a full service research house focusing on integrating validated psychological, neuroscience, and behavioral science-based methodologies into our traditional means of research. And we do this to gain a fuller and deeper understanding of our consumers. Now, anyone that's been following HCD's path for some years now may think that this webinar sounds a bit familiar. In fact, in 2016 or 17 on the conference circuit, we had internally dubbed this topic as, quote, the taking down our own house manifesto. And that's what exactly what we were trying to do and what we felt like we really had to do was speak to acknowledge and educate research consumers on the misinformation that we were hearing, misuse and abuse of the tools and methods that we believe really can be so valuable when used appropriately. And in the past few months, us, like everyone else, <laughs> has been challenged with the inability to conduct in-person research with some of these neuro methods and techniques uh, that we consider to be the gold standard. In addition, when talking to a lot of our clients, they've been using this time in the upside down to explore new methods and techniques. And this combination of events really creates this perfect storm, this perfect atmosphere for neuro hype. Because us as consumers, we tend to take expert or perceived experts word as the truth. And in the world of applied neuroscience research methods, we rely on these professionals to help us build solid and valid research protocols. And, you know, I'm reminded of, of a discussion that I had recently with an academic neuroscientist who is developing an online webcam based neuro research tool. And the theories and science behind their approach was you know, very sound, but the questions or, or concerns immediately start popping up when you dig a little bit deeper. You know, the literature supporting these methods use three high definition cameras. Okay, well, we know consumer webcams aren't on par with this level of quality. What about lighting? What about respondent movement? A child running into the room and distracting the participant. What does this do to the throwaway rate? Is it more than 50%? So this leaves us really begging the question, just because we can, does it mean that we should? And what I see as someone on the, the supplier side of the lens is that clients often don't have the knowledge depth to be asking those tough questions of their research partners. And asking those really tough questions and digging deeper is what's so important to ensuring that the research protocol that's being created is going to actually give you valid, actionable, and, and sound insights. And that's what we really hope to do and help you with today, is to give you the tools to answer the question, just because I can, does it mean that I should? And to do this, we're going to review um, basics, the basic understanding of, of neuro methods, focusing on you know, the, the current climate, in-person versus online tools, and outlining some of the common misinformation or red flags to look out for, and some best practices to follow. 
And bringing us through that today is going to be Michelle and Catherine. Uh, Dr. Michelle Nigella is our VP of Research and Innovation here at HCD. She's a behavioral neuroscience expert in neuropsychology, psychology, and consumer science. And Catherine Ambrose, our manager of behavioral and marketing sciences with a background in neuro and business. Now, one last thing before I toss it over to Michelle. Again, please take advantage of the Q&A option on the Zoom platform. Feel free to ask any questions throughout the presentation and we'll aim to answer them even as they come up or after the discussion. And if time doesn't allow, we'll certainly follow up with you after the webinar. So with that, Michelle, take it away. Hi, everybody, uh, and welcome. So great to uh, see the names pop up and to be talking to you once again. Uh, like Allison was saying, this topic is very near and dear to us, uh, and we find it to be very important, especially right now when a lot of people are trying uh, to find new ways to do research in our new world. Um, so moving right in, I like to start with the big picture. Um, when we're talking about neuroscience, it's very important to take a step back and understand a little bit about what neuroscience is. A lot of times when people are thinking about neuroscience, they're thinking about the brain. And so we're looking at measures about what can measure the brain. Um, but then we have to take a step back and really think about what is it that our brain is doing and is it possible to measure these things? So the images I have here on the left of the screen are images of on the bottom, you have an axon and a dendrite. So this is a neuron. Um, and then at the top, you have how neurons communicate at the synapse. And in the middle, uh, you have a picture of the brain. And the, the point I like to make with starting here about the building blocks of neural communication is because in order for us to do all the things that we do, everything from standing upright and breathing all the way to making really complex decisions at a shelf involve 100 billion neurons. So this little thing here on the, the bottom left of the screen is a neuron and there are 100 billions of those in the brain. That 100 billion neurons makes 100 trillion connections that you see in the top left. And it's really important to take a step back and think about this because it's a very complex system. And so it is actually very difficult to measure things in the human brain. Now, if we were sea slugs, we could very easily see, um, you can actually see in the dish, the, the neurons making those um, communications with the additional neurons. Um, but when you're looking at the human brain, about three pounds of flesh there that um, has all these 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion connections all squished together, it can be very noisy when the brain is also controlling your breathing and controlling your heart rate and controlling, you know, your standing upright and being able to see all these things are going on. So it's a very complex system and we have to appreciate when we start this how complex that system truly is. So what is neuromarketing? Um, neuromarketing is this idea of being able to take this very complicated system and all the research that has happened in academia using very complex and, and high grade tools to be able to measure brain activity and make some sort of understanding of what consumers are doing. So the way I define this is that neuromarketing is how the knowledge of some very esoteric anatomic cellular and signal processing in the brain can somehow help you understand consumer interaction with products and communications. And so you can see this is actually a huge leap. So we have to appreciate that again as we you know, start to, to you know, think about using neuroscience and psychology because it is a very complex system. And so neuromarketing, actually, the term neuromarketing fell out of favor some years ago. Um, and people started using the idea of system one, which if you're familiar with that, that is uh, coming from behavioral economics. And it's the idea that you have um, in your decision-making process, there are two systems, system one and system two, system one being the non-conscious side of your decision-making. Um, now, if you read Kahneman, who came up with this, this theory, um, he talks about system one and system two working together for you to make your decisions. However, in the world and field of neuromarketing, people started saying everything had to be system one. And then the, the terminology changed from neuromarketing to measuring system one. Um, and that started falling out of favor because people started realizing that 
um, you know, it isn't just system one, right? There are conscious decisions we make. Not everything is, is a non-conscious decision. Um, you know, if you're thinking about buying a car, for example, yes, your system one, your unconscious might be very much attracted to the red shiny sports car, but your system two realizes that you have a 50 mile commute and gas is expensive or whatever it might be. Uh, and so you can't afford the shiny sports car. Let's go for the used Honda Civic. Right, so system two is important. And so the terminology changed to behavioral science to really include all these aspects. So you wanna look at the neuroscience and you wanna look at the psychology, the behavioral economic theories behind it, um, the, both the cognitive and the non-conscious sides that go into our decision-making. So I like to bring up a little bit of this history because it really is important that the actual companies that provide the research and the theories that all go into this has not changed throughout the series of you know, the past 20 years of using um, this sort of approach. It has gone from neuromarketing to behavioral science, but it really is the, the same product just with a different packaging, right? So what are some of the tools that are used now in the before times, as we like to talk about, um, you could use any of these tools, right? So a lot of the measurements that were done for consumer neuroscience was in person. Um, and you would be using any of these tools here. You can see that we have on the far left, the more biometrics or psychophysiological measures um, that include electrodes on the body and the face. Um, you have eye tracking. We have two types of EEGs that you can see here on the top and on the bottom. And you can see they're vastly different, one being more clinical grade and one on the bottom being more commercial grade. Uh, and you get what you pay for with that, right? Um, there's also fMRI. Uh, and facial coding and implicit association. These are all tools of the trade. It's not exhaustive, but we do like to bring up here that these are off the shelf tools, meaning that you do not have to have a special license or any special degree in order to use these tools. You can, as long as you have the money and the will, you can go out there and buy any of them. Um, for example, even fMRI, as long as you have $3 million and you wanna go and buy a decent fMRI machine, you can do it. Um, it's really more of a question of understanding how to use it properly and also um, you know, being able to apply it and get the correct uh, understanding from it. So the the uh, interpretation of the results. But anybody out there can buy it. I, you know, my neighbor could go out right now, buy an fMRI, hang a shingle up and say that they're a, a neuromarketer, right? Um, the problem is, is that you really do get what you pay for in this and um, that not all tools are equal, right? So, and I also like to say that it's not the tool, the fault of the tool. All these tools do exactly what they're supposed to do. It's really the fault of the researcher on using them properly and interpreting the results correctly. The tool will always do what it's supposed to, but you have to design your experiment correctly and you have to interpret the results responsibly. And when I say that these things are off the shelf, I really truly do mean off the shelf in that you can go on Amazon and if you have Prime, you can have something tomorrow. Um, you know, that you can measure. Um, so you can get galvanic skin response measures. You can get EEG, um, eye tracking, all sorts of different tools. You can go on Amazon and buy yourself right now. And the reason I bring this up is to, again, strengthen the point that there is no um, licensure to be a neuromarketer or a behavioral scientist. You um, can simply buy any of these things and say that you do it. So that should be a little bit of a, a warning to anyone that's, that's looking to do these tools just because someone says they can, as Allison was saying, doesn't mean you necessarily should. Um, and we've always been forefront in saying, you know, when you shouldn't do something. Um, as much as we would like to be able to apply these tools to everything, the truth is sometimes you don't have to. So what do we mean when we say using the right tool for the right question? Um, there's a lot of assumption that if you were, for example, to get an EEG device that you can put on people's heads, that you can somehow read people's minds. And that's simply not true. Um, EEG is a very specific tool. Each of the tools have very specific functions and they're all different. They're not gonna give you the same answers. So um, particularly when you have questions that come from marketing that tend to be a bit complex when it comes to psychology or neuroscience. So often when it comes from um, neuroscience, they will ask a question like, can this aroma be more extrovert or spiritual? That is a very difficult question for a neuroscience measure to measure. EEG cannot do that. Um, galvanic skin response cannot do that. So when you're looking at different um, tools to use, neither of these tools, be it uh, 
uh, facial coding on the left or EEG on the right, neither of them are going to tell you if it's extrovert or spiritual. You might get that from a cognitive question straightforwardly asking someone, or you might want to use something like implicit association, right? So on the left, the facial coding is only going to get you the basic emotions that are listed here, nothing more than that. Um, and EEG is going to get you activity in the brain, but there is no particular area of the brain that is spiritual, right, or extrovert. So, you know, you really have to think about the research question uh, first. So don't lead with the tool, rather lead with the research question, and then have the, the person you're working with, the expert you're working with, help you decide which is the right tool for you and your research project. Now, during these unprecedented times, which is a you know, a terminology that I, I really hate because I feel it's overused right now, but during these unprecedented times um, where we, you know, are very cautious about bringing people into facilities, things are starting to open up now, but we're still being very cautious and trying to be mindful of everybody's health. But during this time, there's been a large push for doing a lot more online research, and that is great. There are wonderful tools that you can do online, but we felt it very important to stop and think about those online tools when we're talking about neuroscience or psychology, stop and think about where we are applying these tools, how we are applying them, and what sort of results we can truthfully expect from them. Uh, and that's very important for everybody to really take into consideration while these tools might be super cool, might be super interesting, um, and everybody is trying to try out new things, we do have to be very aware uh, of the limitations of all the tools. Because even in in-person research, these tools all have limitations and all have drawbacks. There is no perfect tool that's going to be able to do everything. And that's even more so when it comes online, as Allison was talking about, when you have issues of um, you know, the quality of the webcam or the type of measure that you're trying to do, the no noises that can happen within people's homes, we really have to be aware that this can definitely limit the type of data that we are looking at. So when we're looking at these tools that, you know, are the typical tools used in consumer neuroscience, um, I've, you know, they're circled here and highlighted in blue, uh, the ones that are currently being pushed to, to move online. So we have the, the biometrics, we have eye tracking, we have facial coding and implicit association. Um, so all of these things are things that are being proposed as being of being online. Um, obviously, you can't do fMRI or EEG. This requires gear that has to be put on a person in order to do those measures, so those aren't considered um, online tools. Um, but when we're looking at these online tools, uh, again, we have to be very cautious, and we're going to start reviewing that uh, as I bring Catherine on, um, but we do implicit association quite often because that doesn't require some sort of webcam. Um, we do have to realize that when we do implicit association online, that you still have the problem of uh, noises that can happen in someone's house that you have no control over. If people come into a facility, obviously we can minimize the amount of noise and distraction, but when people are in their homes, it's very difficult to make sure that there aren't distractions. Um, and that's one of the problems for, for all the, the online tools, but um, as we will go ahead and start bringing in Catherine here to uh, talk about these things. And she's going to review eye tracking, facial coding, and um, the physiological measures that can be done uh, on webcam. What are the drawbacks and how maybe you can, can use them in a responsible way. So Catherine, if you would like to go ahead and join us, um, then we will launch right in. That'd be great. Thanks, Michelle. So let's dive right into one of the most popular tools for remote research, eye tracking. Essentially, eye tracking is just an objective measure used to assess visual attention. And just to clarify, this is measuring visual attention. So you could be watching this slide and still thinking about how terribly Game of Thrones ended and the eye tracker would never be able to pick that up. Michelle had mentioned this, but just to reiterate, no tool remote or in person can read your mind. So talking about remote eye tracking, it's typically done with a webcam while in-person research uses eye trackers such as eye tracking glasses, screen-based trackers, and head-mounted trackers that you can see on the right. It's important to note that regardless of what type of eye tracker you choose, there should always be a calibration period where the system is able to learn how a person's eye move moves when looking at a certain part in the screen. 
So when you're comparing eye tracking versus a web camera, it does make a difference. The eye trackers are built with projectors that make patterns of near infrared light that reflect off the eye, allowing the eye tracker to capture eye movement and patterns. On the other hand, you have web-based eye tracking that only detects light from the visible spectrum because its primary function is just you know, a normal camera. So that is definitely going to have an influence on both the quality as well as the type of research that you're gonna conduct. So the images here show you some of the different outputs possible when running in-person eye tracking. There's detailed findings about both spatial and temporal areas of a stimulus that can be determined with the option of breaking the stimuli into different subregions that could be considered specific areas of interest, also known as AOIs. Web-based uh, webcam uh, research is really only as good as the software capabilities, unfortunately, even if it's in the best of circumstances. So the remote webcam research can't offer the same statistical output as an in-person research because there's really high variability and low resolution, which makes things just less precise in general. Also, the webcam is very sensitive to movement, and that causes outputs to be limited to things like areas of interest, number of blinks, loose gaze sequences, as well as heat maps. Um, remote research will always have really high dropout rate, like we've mentioned, and there is the potential that it could also include bad respondents, and that would really muddy the data, which could be a big problem for something like a heat map, because that shares insight into not only where people are looking, but how many people. So overall, eye tracking through a webcam is not as fast or as accurate, since the camera used like the camera used is of different calibers than something of eye tracking glasses or screen based eye tracking because there does present the issue of timing and accuracy. So in general, webcam eye tracking may be useful to get a general idea of where people are looking. However, if you want more in-depth research findings regarding visual attention, it would absolutely be beneficial to look into an official eye tracker in person. So now moving on to another really popular tool that is actually uses cameras both for remote or in-person research regardless is spatial coding. Um, it looks to see how facial expressions change based on exposure to different stimuli and then categorizes those faces based on, um, a, and then they try to categorize those faces that people make into emotional reactions. So there are a couple problems here. The six or seven, if you want to include contempt, basic quote unquote emotions that facial coding is based on has bias considering that there's only one, emo uh, one positive emotion. Facial coding is also only categorizing how faces are displayed. It's not telling you what they're emotionally feeling. We also use our faces all the time as a way to communicate. So there is that reflexive behavior that we mirror what we see. And it makes it really hard to claim that everybody's happy if they're looking at a stimuli that includes something happy like a laughing baby. So really people just are mirroring what they see to communicate. Another reason that this method is also really highly debated in psychology is because of, like I mentioned before, they're considered the basic emotions, or they're supposed to be universal, but people emote and express themselves very differently. So it's kind of controversial to arbitrarily decide when an expression is emoted just enough for it to fit a certain category. With careful research and design, there is a place for facial coding to get some information, and remote research is really easily done with facial coding, but you have to be willing to accept all those limitations as well as a couple other ones on the next slide. Uh, just before we move on, we do have a question about what the limitations are for facial coding when it comes to global research. And just to touch on that, since we're right now talking about the basic emotions, that, that is very true. There are definitely cultures around the world that are less prone to be expressive while other cultures might be more expressive. And so it's really very important to take that into consideration when you are doing global research. Uh, so if you're trying to compare different countries or different cultures, then it may not be a fair comparison. Um, 
So a lot of those things need to be kept within uh, to look for trends perhaps, you know, for a certain country, but it does certainly complicate the data when you're trying to do global research. Um, I believe when Ekman did this research originally, he did look at global. So he was talking about this as being uh, universal emotions. However, that has come up in debate uh, in, in uh, academic psychology as to whether that is really true. Right. So if we go to, the, yeah, so can eye tracking be done with the webcam? We did address this. Yes, it can be done, uh, but you do have to be okay with the type of data you're getting and take all the information you get with a grain of salt. And I think that that question that you just addressed is a really great example of some of the limitations. Uh, so these concerns that we have might be similar to what was seen on the previous eye tracking slide. And you'll notice them reoccurring because it's true for a lot of remote research that you really need to over recruit because there will always be a high throwout rate and you have to recognize that the population is skewed to those who have access to a webcam, are proficient in using it, and also have high speed internet with up to date browsers. Other things with remote research that we just need to consider in general, but do apply to facial coding is the camera quality, especially the condition if you're using a phone or a tablet, as well as lighting. If it's, you know, if it's dark, it's going to be really hard for the camera to be able to pick up the face, as well as we mentioned interferences in the outside world, like a dog barking or a baby uh, start, could start to cry at any point. So these things are all really important. One thing that is also crucial to mention with web-based uh, measures is that you need to make sure that you have consent to have the recording of the person. And people may not be comfortable with that, which could also influence the people that you are having participate in your study. So facial coding studies must be ready to include dropouts because there is also the high variability with distance from the screen, as well as uh, dropouts in recording for things that involve obstruction of view from the face, something like facial hair, bangs, and glasses are really commonly discussed. But you have to also consider something as small as just dust on your webcam could affect your ability to get an accurate reading. And I would also bring up here, since you kind of alluded to it, that um, it's important to realize in dropout uh, and, and your population you're measuring, that some people do not want to be recorded on their webcam. And so once you eliminate that group from the population, again, you have to start to question what sort of population you're really looking at. And actually to, to add to that a little bit further, when we're dealing with a little bit more specific sample populations, if we're trying to fill specific quotas, when we start screening folks out because they don't consent to the webcam, are we really shooting ourselves in the foot and being unable to fulfill a maybe a little tougher to get target sample because they do not consent to accessing the webcam? Do we fall short of our sample plus the high throwaway rate? Is it really just end up being bad research? Absolutely. Good point, Allison. <laughs> um, so now diving into the world of psychophysiological measures, we're going to focus specifically on heart rate and heart rate variability. And honestly, we would be wrong not to highlight that there is so much sensitivity involved in these measures. The insight comes from changes in the heart rate, whether it's going up or down or how the variables uh, how variable those changes are. So it's those changes that actually allow us to use heart rate or heart rate variability to measure attention, arousal, or approach withdrawal. That being said, anything that clouds the heart rate response will ultimately affect its authenticity. So the traditional measures of recording cardiac activity is conducted with an electrocardiogram, an ECG, and that's something that you'll see if you go to the hospital. It, uh, that captures signals by placing two or more electrodes on your skin to pick up the electrical pulses of your heart. And then over time, you get patterns in that autonomic response. This particular measure is actually considered the gold standard of cardiac pulse measurements because it's a direct measure, unlike something like PPG, which is found in things like Fitbits or Apple Watches, 
which actually illuminates the skin to measure light absorption. Basically, the way that one works is that if light is absorbed, there's an increase in blood flow, which over time creates peaks that represent heart rate. So there's also a lot of remote methodologies being developed right now to improve heart rate and heart rate variability measures through mediums like your phone or actually facial videos. But that technology is honestly not robust or accurate enough to apply to a natural condition or to detect heart rate in real time at this point. So uh, can psychophysiological measures be done with webcams? We actually decided to put our money where our mouth was and explore the differences in ECG and online heart rate to compare the results. Uh, here on this graph, you can see that the orange is the ECG and the blue is the webcam heart rate that's being measured over a set period of time. And the webcam heart rate is off by an average of about 2.5 beats per minute throughout the session and is actually off by 23 beats per minute at the point where it strays uh, the most from ECG. So that brings you to about an average of 4% off and 32% off its max, which clearly shows that the, the results were less than promising. So, and actually when you were looking deeper into the webcam software output, it also confirmed data loss and accuracy problems that are commonly seen in remote heart rate research. Any disruption in data collection does delegitimize the chance of real time response findings, especially when you're dealing with something like an ad that may have a time dependent variable. So something like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch wearable, it is useful in certain types of situations, but they can be overpromising, especially if you're trying to get some actionable information from your data. You can see some of the concerns, again, that we have listed here that have been a theme throughout this webinar regarding the quality of the webcam as well as high dropout rates. You should also question your population because of the innate privilege involved in the access to having that computer, phone, or tablet with a webcam. And um, again, we did uh, touch on environmental noise and dirtying data, but just because I love puns and I wanted to get an extra pun in, high variability is really a sure way that you could have your research flatline. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any questions? So yeah, so we have a question about um, when we're talking about the quality of the data, we've brought up a couple times that um, you you will have bad data. How do you know? How do you evaluate the quality of the data? So the quality of the data, honestly, it's, uh, I, we often say bad data in is bad data out. So it's how well you're able to really be able to uh, conduct the research and make sure that it's, you know, it's meeting a very controlled environment. And um, if you collect bad, quote unquote, bad data, um, there is, uh, or let's, let's not even say that the data itself is bad, but there was something like a dog starts barking or there was a slam. Um, certain things can be cleaned, but overall, if there, it, it just gets to a point where the data itself could be so muddied that you, you might be at a loss of when it's actually useful. And to your point, the ways of identifying things like a dog barking or anything like that would be from the video. Now, typically when it's done in person, we make notes, right? So we're able to make note that something happened at a certain time point and we can go back and um, clean that data. Um, or if there was a problem in the equipment or anything like that, then we're able to identify it pretty easily. It just gets a little bit more money when we don't have a control of knowing what's going on in the person's environment. Um, so that's like the first way to really um, you know, evaluate the quality of the data that you're having going in. The other thing is that we always do baseline measures. Um, so we can see right from the get-go whether or not the baseline is, is less variable than if they're being exposed to something. Because, for example, if you're sitting at rest, it should be pretty even. And when some stimulus is introduced, you should see that change. And so if we don't see that change happen, then we realize that something is not linking up right. Now, as long as we are still on heart rate right now, we do have another question about how exactly does a webcam measure heart rate? Catherine, can you discuss that a little bit? Sure. So the so one way that it was it is very popular right now is through uh, facial video processing. It's really 
honestly a hot topic in technology in psychophysiological technology right now. But um, the the issue with it is that it's even if you have that non-intrusive background to help minimize the noise, um, basically it, it's uh, still really difficult to apply the heart rate to the natural conditions, and um, it's. When you have the webcam measure of heart rate right now, it's also often paired with an oximeter to be able to justify blood flow signals in facial regions. So they, they choose a specific area of the skin and then basically through the coloring of your skin, they use that to be able to detect heart rate changes. Um, the reading is also really subjective to the certain skin areas of the face. Plus there's facial expressions and head movements that can degrade the accuracy for this approach. So um, you can see here that there's a lot of uh, advances that really do need to be made before it's a, a thing to be considered as a reliable source, honestly. Sure, so it sounds like a lot can go wrong. Yeah. So moving into how do you sort of identify, you know, who's an expert or if the research that you're doing is good uh, or if there's something you should pursue, uh, we're not saying that you can't use online tools. You certainly can, but you do need to be aware of the sort of data and limitations that you're gonna get. Um, and you have to be able to trust your provider. Um, and as it says here, you know, famous last words are to trust me. Um, when someone says, trust me, rather than explaining, you know, exactly, the reasons they should trust you, um, then you should be seeing that as a red flag, right? So what is an expert? Um, the person should be able to tell you the limitations of each measure. Uh, the person should be able to uh, either show you their own articles that they've published or white papers, or maybe perhaps also, um, you know, provide some case studies that they've actually applied to use these tools. Um, and you should never be scared to ask questions. And when you ask questions, um, the provider should be open to hearing them and they should encourage them and they should be very open with explaining. Um, this does mean that they shouldn't be hiding behind proprietary algorithms, right? They should be able to explain what it means when they say that, you know, X plus Y equals C. Um, does the answer have any substance? This is a very important uh, question to ask when considering if you should use the tool. While it might be interesting to use facial coding and maybe it's exciting to use a new tool, would the answer of um, those six basic emotions really give you the sort of data you need to make a real business decision? Um, that needs to be evaluated. Is it going to meet specific action standards? If um, the provider isn't talking about action standards to decide whether or not a particular stimulus or product or whatever it might be is the winner um, and doesn't have criteria set up to decide that something is the winner um, and can explain how they got to that conclusion, like why that's the case um, without hiding behind the, the algorithms, um, then again, you should perhaps not trust that tool or that provider. Um, so things to look out for when people are trying to sell you these things, because again, the first thing to think of when people are trying to sell you something is that in fact, they are trying to sell you something. They're not trying to not sell you something. Um, so always keep that in mind so that when they start using flashy words like, you know, neuroscience words that maybe are not um, familiar to you, they might be using those to sort of overpower you so that you just will trust them, right? So avoiding flashy hyped words, um, distractions. Um, so if they're not really talking about the distractions that can happen in online uh, data collection, then you should be really concerned that they haven't thought about it, right? Because you, we really need to be aware that distractions in the environment can, can certainly affect the data. Um, again, that black box, if they're just saying that something happens in the background and we get these magical results, um, then you need to be very concerned. If they can't explain what's inside that black box, explain the reasoning behind their proprietary algorithm, then you should be very cautious. Absolutely. I think that it's really important at this point, if there's any takeaway here, is to be comfortable being critical in thinking about the uh, research design and research method and really be comfortable in being skeptical because that's how you get strong evidence for your research. Yes, so it's an unfortunate thing that happens, but there are a lot of charlatans out there, 
as well as a lot of people that are desperately trying to sell their services right now. Um, and so you just need to be cautious, ask the right questions, ask as many questions as you can, and hopefully your research provider um, will be open enough to provide those answers um, or try to. So as I said before, it's very important to recognize that all the methodologies that we've talked about, and even those beyond that, all technologies have limitations. There is never going to be a perfect tool that's going to measure everything about human behavior and cognition. Um, even the best tools out there, the most expensive tools have their limitations. And so we have to be aware of those limitations and always use the right tool for the right question. Just because a tool is very cool or very interesting or very advanced does not mean that it's the right tool to use for your specific research question. Um, also, always integrate your data. Neuroscience and psychology approaches should never be used in a vacuum and alone. They cannot answer most research questions. They need to be combined with traditional approaches such as asking someone. So for example, if you're doing facial coding to find out if someone likes an ad, um, facial coding isn't going to tell you if they like it. They can tell you the facial reactions that they're having while watching the video, but you need to actually ask the person if they like it and you'll get a much more reliable and accurate response from asking a simple liking survey question. Um, always apply action standards. And what we mean by action standards is that it, the data have to reach certain criteria in order to say that a specific prototype is say the winner. Um, to say that the ad was truly effective, there need to be action standards that say it's significantly different from something else or it performs better in a specific way. Um, always vet your provider as well. Find out if they've ever done research, if they've published papers, if they can provide you the reasoning behind um, the data, ask those questions. Uh, make sure that they really know what they're talking about, um, and that they have contract validity, that they're measuring what they say they're measuring. Um, and, but don't be, you know, be totally afraid to try. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try doing these things or that you can't do these things online. You just have to go in with the right understanding of the limitations um, as well as what to expect from the data. So until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can walk. Um, but just be aware that it is a long journey. So with that, I would like to open up for questions. Please uh, use the Q&A or the chat um, functions and, and please ask some questions. We do have some questions already lined up here. Um, if you're not comfortable asking these questions during this call, you can always email us. You can see those here um, to reach out to us directly, or you can also um, go to any of our other resources such as LinkedIn, um, watch our videos on YouTube. We have lots of blogs on these this specific type of um, functions and, and methodologies. Um, follow us on Twitter, we talk about all these things. But for right now, let's go ahead and answer some questions. Um, Allison, I'll pass it off to you. Yes, I love this first question. Can we use virtual reality in these webcam tests? Technically, I would say yes, um, or some sort of, uh, you know, you can have someone in a virtual environment if it's something that they can, you know, see on their computer screen. Um, you can, you know, there's a webcam that's on them. Um, you should be able to link these things up. I, I think the important question here is what you're trying to ask. Um, I think a lot of the questions about using virtual reality, even in on-site research, um, are complicated, right? Um, because the environment of being in virtual reality is already uh, really jarring to some people. So it's, it has been difficult. Um, not to say again that you can't do it. You have the added level of what kind of virtual reality you're talking about. So if the person needs to wear a VR headset, um, then making sure they have that headset uh, and that they're in a safe environment, they're not gonna you know, be walking around and, and get hurt or whatever it might be. Um, but yes, I would say you can do that sort of thing online. Catherine, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, so again, I think you covered it really nicely and it does depend on the research question, but I would also mention that if you are doing, if you are interested in doing virtual reality, there is virtual reality uh, headsets that are being developed with eye tracking actually just uh, as one tool. But there, if you're talking about using it in terms of uh, facial coding, I would stray from that because again, that obstructs the view of the face so it defeats the purpose and um, something you should consider when, you know, when looking into it. Great. 
Uh, another question, do we have any experience with these tools? Have we used them and what is our experience? Yes, so we have used these tools in the past um, and been very frustrated with some of them. Uh, to be totally open and honest, we have done, for example, um, web-based online uh, facial coding. The dropout rate was atrocious. Um, and this was using a, a partner that we, we really trusted, um, that really answered all our questions and partnered with us very closely. So the software we were using, we did trust, um, but all the, the sort of caveats that we brought up were are from our own experience. Um, so in that example, not only um, was there an incredibly high dropout rate, I believe, you know, 70% or so of the sample dropped out. Um, the uh, variability in the data was extreme. Um, and the output was very difficult to um, to then interpret uh, to help the client. And so we do try to suggest not using web-based uh, facial coding as an example. Um, you saw earlier that we, we have done our own internal tests. Um, we you know, vetted out whether or not we should be doing heart rate via webcam and we personally don't trust the data, right? So we are not in favor of doing that. When people have asked us to do it, we are not comfortable moving forward with that. That's not to say you, you shouldn't try. Um, if you're interested, just make sure the partner you're working with, you're asking these questions um, and really getting the data that you need um, to be comfortable with it. Um, as far as eye tracking go, again, we partner with people that are able to, to do it um, and the software that we trust, meaning. Um, but again, you know, we're speaking from experience that, you know, the type of data is different than you would get from having uh, an actual eye tracker. Um, so there are limitations that we have found. Right. And, you know, we kind of talk about all the problems with, with these tools and these technologies, yet we've used them. And I think it's important to, to note that what we try to do, and again, we encourage you to have your partner do the same, is we say, you know, here are all of our concerns, here are all of the limitations, here are things that we really have problems with given this type of methodology. As long as you we can talk about these, we acknowledge them, and we still want to move forward and employ this type of methodology, only then do we really end up doing this because we want to make sure that our partner is fully aware of all of you know, the knowledge and, and concerns that we have and that they can make an informed decision for themselves if they do want to indeed move down that path or not. Exactly. So quickly going back to the idea of the webcam heart rate, Catherine, can you just review this? Are we talking about the change of the color of the skin in the face? Is how they determine the heart rate? Yeah, so the heart rate webcam measures color variation of the skin. And basically what it does is, it, it, what I was saying, it's basically dependent on what area of the skin on the face you'll have it, it, there's even variance in choosing, if you do the forehead compared to the cheek, it will have an influence on uh, the, the, tra the webcam heart rate's ability to, to measure the heart rate. So it's really that it, it looks at the variation of the skin in order to be able to detect heart rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we talked about Webcam-based tools, we talked a little bit about non-web-based cam tools. What do we recommend if we want to continue doing research, but whether um, we're unable to or nervous about bringing people in person and doing in-person methodologies, what are some things that we would recommend? So Michelle did touch on this, that the research question usually shapes the tools that best answer that. But so it's a little hard to just give a blanket statement, but it's important to remember that you could always go back to the idea of using traditional surveys that can be easily done online, as well as elevating them a bit with psychological tests like self-assessment mannequin or the implicit uh, testing that we had mentioned earlier. If you're interested in learning about those a little bit more in depth, we'd be more than happy to share white papers as well as vidcasts on that topic. And to, to this question, 
one, from our perspective, of course, everything is unknown, but when do we think in-person research might resume and how will it be different than what we've done in the past? Allison, I would kind of toss part of that back to you. I would say that we do have um, an internal ethics board where we've been discussing, you know, how we would find it to be safe to start bringing people in. Um, we are following all CDC guidelines and we will have that guideline available to anybody who's interested. So if you're interested, please reach out and we're happy to um, provide that list with you of the criteria. Um, but we've also been following very carefully uh, not only the CDC guidelines, but also with our facility partners to check mm -hmm. on when they're opening up. So I don't know, Allison, if you'd like to comment on that. Right. And it's, it's, we have some great partners that, you know, we've been really close contact with and obviously they're at the, you know, really at the heart of this is their business surrounds people actually coming in person. And while they may be given the green light to open up um, and they can conduct research, we're trying to have conversations with them about, you know, are people willing to come? And if so, how does that affect recruiting? And again, it goes back to that question of, and our, and our, at the end of the research, who do we actually have? Is it too close to things freshly opening up where we may have a little bit of a skewed population? So it's things like that that really need to be taken into consideration. But anyone from the facility side, you know, is, is also been really great with sharing their perspective, the steps that they're taking. So in obviously different states are a little bit different, but I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, but again, everything is so fluid, so unknown that there's no real hard date to it. I believe we have another question here about um, on our analyses that we run. Um, if you're interested in getting a case study, please feel free to reach out to us and we can provide you with a case study. Um, but they're asking if we're looking, if we look for statistical significance and effect sizes, absolutely. We run statistics on all the data we collect, whether it's um, traditional quant um, or any sort of neuroscience or psychological measure we do. Um, I think that's another red flag you should always keep in mind that if your research provider isn't doing statistics and um, isn't showing you the statistical results, then um, I would take into question whether or not they are measuring what they say they're measuring. Uh, we very strongly stick to not saying that you have a real effect unless it is statistically significantly different from some sort of baseline and also that it is different from either a control or a um, benchmark. You know, this is the action standard that we set to make sure. So in order to say that you have a real effect that someone does in fact feel happy or that they really are feeling more excited or that, you know, a particular product is performing better than another, we absolutely require statistical significance um, and uh, and true results in that in that way, and we're happy to provide any sort of case study if you're interested. Great. Well, with that, Catherine, Michelle, is there anything else that you would like to mention before we uh, cut the cord? Sure. We have a series of uh, vidcasts available on our YouTube channel, uh, or you can also go to the website to find them. Um, but it's really some really interesting deeper dives into all these methodologies, both online and um, in person. Um, so you can, you know, go and watch some videos of when we explain some further details in those. Uh, white papers available on the website. Uh, we're happy to talk about any of these topics anytime. So please feel free to reach out with any additional questions or if you'd like to know more. All right. Thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate it and have a great rest of the week and a great weekend.